Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Alina Islam, and I'm a Senior Research Associate here at Red Cloud Securities. Today's webinar focuses on Klondike Gold Corp, an exploration company focused on advancing the Klondike District Gold Project located in the historic Klondike Gold Fields. Today, we have with us Peter Talman, President, CEO, and Director of the company. For the webinar today, Peter will provide an introduction to Klondike, including an overview of its current exploration activities and what we may have to look forward to with the company. After the presentation, we'll take questions live. Please send us your questions via the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. Before we get started though, I just wanted to mention a few disclosures. For Klondike Gold, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct yes. listeners to the yes. cautionary note on page two of the Klondike Gold corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for Klondike Gold specific disclosures. With that, Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Please take it away. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone. And I guess good afternoon for those in Toronto. Good morning for those who are in Vancouver where I am. Uh, they let me out of the Yukon, so it's great to be here giving a talk on Klondike Gold. Uh, the title, Building Gold Resources in the Historic Klondike Gold Fields. Well, okay, so we're new. the one title change, it's near term, and I'm gonna be talking about the near term resources uh, and also our plans for this year. Uh, and next, right, thank you. So there are forward-looking statements. I'm actually going to say forward-looking statement because I'm going to be talking about mineral resources prospectively. Um, and so that we're, we're required to make a proximal statement of forward-looking statements. That's why it's going to be in the sentence. Uh, company overview, Klondike Gold. We have 164 million shares issued currently at $25 million market cap. I'm going to emphasize that because I think we're dramatically undervalued currently. Uh, we're exploring only one property. It's in Yukon, just outside of Dawson. It basically surrounds Dawson City. Uh, it covers 586 square kilometers of ground. We own the entirety of what you would consider to be the Klondike Gold Fields, which was the gold discovery in 1896 that has been worked continuously from then until now. Uh, there's been 20 million ounces of gold recovered and mined from creek gravels there over the 125 year history. Uh, there's still 30 to 40,000 ounces of gold being recovered annually from the creek gravels, so it's by no means done from that perspective. The Klondike has been considered to be an orogenic gold deposit and that, that model has been applied to it, but until basically until now, no one has really documented why that's an orogenic gold system. Um, and I, I'm gonna show you some new research, and this is breaking stuff, um, that shows the potential of the Klondike is significantly greater than what most everyone thought. Um, so we have multi-kilometer gold mineralization in a belt that's basically unknown um, in Canada, strangely. And we're about to have our first ever bedrock mineral resource. It should be out in the next couple of months. And that's the first ever bedrock gold documented in Klondike in 125 years. And it's documenting the sources of the Klondike alluvial placers. So just to begin with, as I said, we have a 25 million market cap. We are financed currently. Um, it's actually 3.5 million dollars in cash because we've started our 2022 spend. Uh, the seven year price chart, just because it's bad, I'm gonna emphasize it. Uh, I've been at the Vancouver Resource Investors Conference and, and everyone keeps asking this question. And 
when I started this position, this 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 chart represents my tenure as the CEO of Klondike Gold. Uh, when I coming in, I more or less promised or anticipated finding the source or figuring out the source of the Klondike in three years. So here we are going into year eight. It's the longest three years of my professional career, but we've got it done now. And I can't emphasize that enough is, and we're about to get into these maps, but we have the Klondike figured out. And contrary to popular opinion, there is an enormous amount of gold there and there's an enormous amount of potential yet to come. Um, and so share distribution, there's a list of shareholders, Frank Juster and Eric Sprott are still notably in the deal. I own 5% of it. I have a fair bit of my own personal wealth in this company. And I think it's a fantastic investment. Uh, newsletter writers and analysts, Red Cloud, Taylor is, is on side as a, and I'll, the first Berlin that's in Europe. We have an, a European shareholder base. Uh, and Jay Taylor covers us from a newsletter writer perspective. Um, we also have experienced professional leadership. Uh, I won't really get into the details, but collectively we have the experience all of discovering, advancing, uh, documenting, turning into mines and financing mineral deposits. Uh, and it's a great group of people and I enjoy working with them. So where are we? In Dawson, I emphasize the Tintina Gold Belt is a Cretaceous Age gold belt, and there's deposits within it, two different types. There's orogenic gold deposits of Cretaceous Age, and also intrusion-related gold deposits of Cretaceous Age. So in our nearby neighborhood, Dublin Gulch, Victoria Gold's deposit and mine, and it's adjacent Banyan, uh, which just announced a 4 million ounce resource yesterday. Uh, collectively, there's that, those are both in intrusion related gold deposits. Uh, then directly below us, white gold, uh, and that's an orogenic style deposit. And coffee, which Newmont owns, is also orogenic. Also just to the left on the map, Pogo is also orogenic and the rest basically in Alaska are a mixed bag, but mostly intrusion related. Uh, I'm gonna show another map in a minute, kind of the global picture, but intrusion related gold, or the orogenic gold deposits model uh, applies more or less to the Klondike, white gold and coffee uh, in our local area. So what you need for orogenic gold deposits are orogenic deep crustal structures. And we've recognized those in the Klondike. And I'm just gonna show you that because this is, this is where the revelation in the last basically six months has come. In the big picture, that age, 100 million years of age, it makes a really big difference. So if I showed you uh, up until now, the Klondike has been thought to have been mineralized in the Jurassic, so in around 160 million years ago, the Klondike supposedly had some gold mineralization. Nobody cares about Jurassic Age mineralization from an orogenic perspective. There is basically none in the world. And so if it's Jurassic, it's really uninteresting. Um, all of our multidisciplinary research over the last seven years has shown that the gold is much younger than that. Still unconstrained, we don't have an absolute age date for it, but it's definitely younger. Uh, at Coffee, the Newmont deposit just to the south of us, which is exact in the exact same rocks, that was also thought to be Jurassic until then Gold Corp did their own research, sponsored a PhD, and they determined an age date of demineralization at 100 million years Cretaceous. So I'm showing you a map of the world as it looked like in the Cretaceous, and it connects on the same convergent, uh, so compressional um, plate tectonic boundary, three of the largest orogenic gold fields on the planet, particularly in that age. And beginning in California, California mother load was discovered in 1896. It, it is an orogenic belt. It has a geology that's actually identical to the Titina in the Klondike. And our Klondike property 
Lone Star would be in the position of Sutter's Creek in California if we were to superimpose them. Um, California has produced 43 million ounces, roughly, of placer gold since 1848, and a little over 120 mil, around 120 million ounces of bedrock gold from underground or surface gold deposits. Um, coming to the Klondike, there's been 20 million ounces of gold still mined or being mined from the Klondike and zero until now in bedrock. And then going around to Kalima, that's the Russian gold belt that was found in 1936 and really been developed post World War II. They've, it, it's a super deposit. It's got so far 95 million ounces of placer uh, gold from gravels and somewhere north of 200 million ounces of of bedrock gold being mined currently, and there's six really big mines operating there now. Uh, the point being here, there's an endowment multiple. If you find the gold in Placer, there's some greater amount still left in the bedrock. And there's every indication in the Klondike that there's lots of gold left, and it's not small. There's a significant bedrock potential. And so using the math here, we're looking for something like 40 or 50 million ounce gold endowment. It's a giant gold deposit district. And that's what we think we can prove. The other thing is uh, the, these orogenic gold deposits, they're, they are characterized as either widespread small, so, so substitute the word sheeted quartz veins in that, and also super large quartz stock works. So we have evidence of both within our belt, which I'm about to show you. In the upper left, I don't know if that's cleared or not, but anyway, in the upper left, that cloddy stuff was one of the first drill holes we drilled in 2015, and it's characterized by centimeter clots of gold in a drill hole. And that basically is the standard zone, and the standard zone for us is the is the uh, source of El Dorado Creek. And then on the upper right over here, the millimeter sized flakes of gold, that characterizes the Lone Star Zone, which basically also looks like that. Those are 200, yeah, we, we use Rubbermaid tubs. There's 200 ounces in each of those tubs. Um, and it's all fine flaky gold that you can spoon like cornflakes. It's really cool to do that. And that's the Lone Star Zone. The two are completely distinct. Sorry, in the Standard Zone down here, this is, both of these come from the Standard Zone as this is in Drill Core. Um, and so they're distinct zones and they represent the, the, upper, sh the upper disseminated stuff is more characterized in sheeted veins and the Standard Zone cloddy material is these big, big quartz veins that ho have coarse clots in them. Again, this is consistent with the, the global model of orogenic gold deposits and the idea that there's a potentially enormous endowment within the Klondike. The other thing, in the last two weeks, we published the first ever 43101 geology technical report relating to the Klondike. And again, going back historic, well, for the last 20 or so years, the gold or the gold has been considered to be Jurassic. And the mapping, and this the map on the left, is the official current map, Geological Survey of Canada compilation based on mapping from certain individuals in the last 20 years. Um, and basically everything is undivided and notable for the absence of faults of any sort. If you have an origin of gold deposit, you must have a fault. That's just a requirement of it. How over the last 20 odd years, you could say there is orogenic gold mineralization in the Klondike and not put a fault in the map is beyond me. Uh, on the right hand side is our map. And so this is going to replace the GSC. Um, what you see on the, on the right, basically we show crustal scale faults. There's three of them. They divide different age terrains. They're major terrain boundaries, and they run the length of the district. Those are the conduit for gold mineralization in the Glendike. There is your ultra or your, your super large deposit potential recognized on that. The other thing is we've, we've actually 
recognize the major units and, and map them, whereas before they were unmapped. Um, and we've recognized that some of the units and the distribution that were previously there are wrong, um, and that has age and exploration implications as well. Basically, anywhere where there's a boundary here, it's probably gold mineralized. Um, and that puts like 120 or 180 or 200 line kilometers of thrust. These are crustal scale thrusts within our property. And there you go, that's the source of all the gold in the Klondike as a plumbing system. We've shown this to a bunch of different research um, people. And again, it's borrowing what Gold Corp back in the day did, was go to research partners and have them document this stuff because we're busy doing exploration. Um, so we showed this to the Colorado School of Mines who jumped all over it. And so we're now partnered on the left-hand side, Colorado School of Mines. They're, they're basically the adjunct, which is the subsurface earth, earth resource modeling uh, group. Uh, and also through them, U of Ottawa, we're going to have a master's. We've applied collectively to the National Science Foundation. And this is for globally significant research. And we believe we're going to get funded by the National Science Foundation for documenting the age and style and character of gold mineralization in the Klondike uh, and being able to compare it to the California Mother Load Belt um, because basically this is all part and parcel of the same thing. On the right hand side, we've gone to U of T and Dalhousie, uh, and we're there's a PhD honors uh, joint uh, research group coming and these people are looking at different aspects of the geology in Klondike. I'm going to note something I'm very proud of. The, the Dalhousie honors student is a, is a Dawson native and he started cutting core for us when he was 16 and is now just graduating and coming back to work for us and do his honors and that's, that's a great, great thing for us and him and I hope we all get a lot out of it. Uh, as well, Another partnership is Minerva Intelligence. That's basically a data, data analytics firm. We've collected seven odd years of really good geoscience, and we're looking for ways to organize and, and uh, express it. And in support of the collaborative research that we're doing, uh, this is already bearing fruit. It's really interesting to see all the, uh, the associations between geophysics and geochemistry that are defining our drill targets right now. Uh, and then finally, in the bottom, Yukon Geological Survey, we've partnered both with the Bedrock Geology people and also with surficial geology uh, in the mapping effort to better constrain what is actually going on in the Klondike after 125 years of mystery. So that's been a lot of introduction, I guess. Um, this particular slide, I've shown this before. This is really a resume of what we've done the last 20 or the last seven years. Um, the last two years has been resource drilling, but we've made a bunch of different discoveries throughout the belt. There's an enormous amount of gold there from an exploration point of view that needs to be defined and understood, but fundamentally, a lot of potential. That's really all I need to say about that. What the potential looks like on this map, this is a very, very, very small subset of the entirety of the 586 square kilometer property. And it shows the Lone Star Zone, which is a part of what we're about to have a mineral resource on, and the Standard Zone, which is the other part. And so basically the red blobs in this map, right about here, and this small bit here, and there's a small bit in under that, are, is what is going to form, is going to be the initial mineral resource, the first mineral resource ever in 125 year history. So this zone is actually being eroded that way into Bonanza Creek uh, down in there. And this is being eroded that way into El Dorado Creek, which lies there. And these two are the source of Bonanza Creek, which was the original discovery. And the standard zone is the source of El Dorado Creek gold, which is the most prolific uh, creek, plaster producing creek in the Klondike. It was found by Anton Stander, that's why it's named that way. And throughout that, what we have is, you know, is a couple of bobs of highly drilled mineral, uh, close space drilling, as well as 
wider space drilling out to about three kilometers on both of them and then further work so each of these zones we know is about five kilometers long going if you remember the original map that has these structures go the entire length of the district they're 60 kilometers long and that's what we think this is this these structures go the length of the district they are variably mineralized so it can't all be solid gold everywhere but we think there's an enormous amount of potential and we are only beginning to scratch the surface just in this zone here um, and so i am um, a forward-looking statement um, what we're planning to announce in the next couple of months is a mineral resource of between half a million and under a million ounces um, and that will be contained within the most of the Lone Star Zone, which is this part, basically, without the blobby bits on the ends that aren't connected, and also on the standard zone, this bit in here and this bit in there. And so not a whole lot, um, but that the, the two zones are completely different in style. Lone Star is, is lower grade. That's where the bulk of our drilling is, and I've said this before in talks, Lone Star Zone was not the best, it's just the first thing we found. So we have more drilling there. We like the standard zone much, much better. And so in 2022, with the money that we have right now, we're gonna drill this gap, which is just a boomingly obvious place to go and expand the standard zone. Standard zone basically has twice the, twice the grade in it that Lone Star has. And so our plan, coming up is to have a published mineral resource based on the end of 2021 drilling from most of Lone Star and the bits of Standard Zone as a start. And then in 2022, from 2022 drilling in the gap and wherever else we get to this year, uh, we will have an updated mineral resource um, sometime in 2023. Uh, that'll have a PEA and metallurgy attached to it. So and just looking at the Lone Star Zone, really what's important on this is the gravity, gravity recoverable stuff. No matter where we go, we're seeing coarse, visible gold, either millimeter scale at the Lone Star Zone or centimeter scale at standard. Uh, it's all easily recoverable uh, using a sluice box, basically. One of the things we did last year uh, right at the end of the year is stake the both the Lone Star Zone and the Placer. I don't know if you're if um, anyway uh, the Lone Star Zone and Standard Zone to Placer and applied permits applied for mining permits as a Placer uh, and those are wending their way through the Yukon government right now. And we're actually optimistic that we will get permits for that in the next couple of weeks to a month. And that would give us, I'm gonna go back, uh, that would give us the option, and we're planning on doing something with this bit of colluvium, that's five or 600 meters long, uh, you know, crops up at surface. As you can see in the purpley bits are the better bits of grade. So the best grade in Lone Star is actually sitting at surface and accessible with a backhoe. Um, and that would amount to, again, forward-looking statement, something like a quarter million ounces just sitting there, um, somewhat weathered already and easily accessible um, from a potential placer mining operation. So this is our kind of the backup plan in terms of there's quite a bit of money sitting on surface um, and operating a plant that could be substantially economically meaningful to Klondike from a financial perspective uh, in the near future. And that is the idea of bringing forward a 10 year mine plan. We don't really need cyanide heap leach. We don't have any of those problems or, or potential permitting problems. So it's a fairly straightforward, easy operation that's understandable to the permitting people because it's placer and everybody in the Klondike gets placer. Uh, and so here's a here's a road to production that's pretty simple. Uh, anyway, the last little bit is 
again, the belt, the belt is full of gold. We know in gold run at the other end of the belt, there's gold there. Tech operated a, a mine uh, right adjacent to where we have mineralization from the, through the early 80s, late 90s. It was tech's most profitable mine in the company's history. Uh, and they started in Placer and went into the bedrock exactly like what we're thinking of doing at Lone Star. Um, and we think this is a great way to go, at least to get started uh, and to build trust and partnerships with the local First Nations and others and, uh, and to get started on development if we get that far, as long as we get the permit. Um, and lastly, infrastructure advantage. We have a fantastic infrastructure in Dawson. It's a mining community. Uh, the, the property itself is bisected by government maintained roads. The Newmont just got permit, permitted to develop the coffee deposit. Uh, and their access road goes right through the middle of our property as well. They're going to upgrade that and I believe put a power line through it. So great. That means Gold Run, which is at the other end of our district right now, will be that much closer to really nice infrastructure. Um, we're on an airport. There, our claims come within half a kilometer of the airport itself. We're on the Klondike Highway. It is a great place to do exploration and development. It's very cheap and our operating costs are, well, a dollar spent here goes a long way. Um, so with that, as a reminder, this, this property has been overlooked for 125, well, actually, I'm gonna go back. This has not really been overlooked for 125 years. The early explorers, in 1900, 1920, 1948, and 1960, there were four different efforts looked at the gold in the Klondike and documented these sheeted veins and such and, and thought there was potential. However, at the time, the price of gold was between $20 and $60 an ounce. And open pitable deposits, gold anywhere, really during that period were not considered. And it really wasn't until Nevada got rolling in the mid 60s and the, and the rise in gold price or the free float of gold price in the 70s that open pit mining becomes a viable option. So historically, you know, nobody really looked at gold in the Klondike. And that's one of the reasons historically why there never really was a bedrock mine. Nobody, the bedrock high grade deposits are infinitely harder to find. And then the last 20 years, as I showed you earlier, the, the mismapping and the mischaracterization of the Klondike contributed to basically poor exploration and no results until now. So we've changed all that, I think, and we're gonna we're gonna continue to document like gold resources. There's lots of lots of potential. We think that this is a the belt has potential for giant gold deposit size. There's multiple zones we know of already, and we're gonna find more, I'm certain. Uh, the mineralization so far we've explored is at surface, um, and we have yet to start testing it at depth. So there's lots of, we can go in every direction in all zones uh, and find more, I believe. Uh, the catalyst, we just had one the last two weeks. It was really important to get the geology out and finally begin to correct the record and to show that there is indeed potential, great potential in the Klondike and put the Klondike into the gold map of the rest of the world. Um, and we're planning on having a first mineral resource estimate in the next couple of months. We are just beginning right now, 8,000 meters of drilling this year. We're gonna target that gap I showed you uh, initially with a, certainly the first 2,500 meters to bring that gap of no drilling into hopefully uh, the mineral resource model. Um, and on the basis of whatever we get in, the, in this year's drilling, uh, we would update our mineral resource and we're planning to tack onto that a PEA, a preliminary economic assessment. And for that, we'll need metallurgy. So we have that work planned in the fall and through this coming winter. And the mine permits I alluded to are placer mines mine permits and I will update that in the next month or so but those could also be transformative particularly if we manage to get a placer mine program um, at Lone Star 
recovering gold this year. Um, as I also showed you, there's a pipeline of new dirt drill targets. It's just an immense amount of exploration potential. We just don't have time and currently don't have the resources to get to all of it all at once. Um, and we have the infrastructure advantage, skilled labor. We do have really good relationships personally with Trondex and with Dawsonites. Um, and we're supportive of all their social initiatives. And uh, I look forward to working there in the coming years and decades. And with that, I'll turn it over and uh, let people ask questions. Well, uh, thank you, Peter. That was a very informative presentation. So we'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, just a reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Um, so oh. Peter, um, first off. Yeah. Did we lose you? No. Oh, right there. Okay. If you can hear, yeah, it just says connection is low at the moment. So there you go. Okay. Um, no worries. So um, the 8,000 meter drilling program that you mentioned, you said about 2,500 meters will target that gap zone between the loan and standard zones. Um, what about the rest of it? What's the plan for the remainder of that program? Well, the 2,500 meters is going in, into the gap. Uh, if we are drilling, uh, we can put the entire 8,000 meters onto extensions of the standard zone. Um, if the results are positive, we probably will do that. We, we did have initially a plan to drill a gold run at the other end of the belt first with 2,000 to 2,500 meters. Um, the roads are bad. The snow pack, this, well, the snow is a record snowfall in Dawson. Um, it, it's the greatest amount of snow since record keeping started in, in 1896. And so that end of the belt is just kind of functionally hard to deal with this year. So yeah, standard zone 2,500 meters. If we're hitting, which I expect we will, we'll keep going. If not, we want to focus most of that on the standard zone because it's the best grade material. So we would keep it going outside to the other ends. And uh, then Lone Star is at higher elevation. So functionally, it's easier to get to later on in the summer when all the snow gets off it. Um, and so we may have a program there. But those are lower grade ounces, so we have to basically drill twice the number of drill holes to get the same number of ounces if we were to drill standard. So it's what what we're doing is is trying to add. We we don't yet have a mineral resource, so again we're expecting to publish one in a couple of months. I'm looking ahead to pass that to the following update, and we're trying to get the bigger number. Uh, as big a number as possible for that update, and that's where the, re the meterage will go. And oh, I hope great. you guys, um, I'm, okay, I'm back on, on low connection, that's weird. I'm in Vancouver, come on. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, your, your camera's gone off again, but that's okay. Um, we'll just uh, get through the rest of the questions here. Um, so I know you're starting a field work program to uh, support the PEA that's coming next year. Um, could you dig a little deeper into what you have planned? Well, that's, I mean, the, the PEA um, actually really doesn't, we, we already have the metallurgical samples, so that would form part of it. Um, and that just needs, we're negotiating with two different groups who would, uh, be our consultants on the on the network in terms of flow and what we what we need to do and We have we're in discussion again with someone who's going to write the PEA and do the mining engineering and whatnot and Their work would come in the summer um, But most of that is really desktop. We, ha we have a lot of that data, too, so we can provide it and uh, They just it, it's pretty pretty straightforward actually so it doesn't need a lot of field work in either case. I'm just economic analysis and results of gravity and we're gonna do some other, well, we will try cyanide and a bunch of different styles of metallurgical test, uh, but I'm principally interested in just straight old gravity. Uh, I think that works and, and we'll go from there. 
Okay. Uh, any plans for the gay gold showing? <laughs> That's the one we're excluding from our resource. If you some eagle-eyed people there saw it, there, there we do have a, a a little bit of a resource block on it. Uh, we drilled it last fall, and yes, I, I'm again. It, it would be sometime later on in the summer when it, it's very easy to get to. It's right on or right off El Dorado Creek directly on the El Dorado Road. Uh, and so that would be the go-to place again this coming summer to be the last thing we drill before we leave. And so again, the optionality here is we would go there and try to extend it. And we have some really nice target areas in mind. Um, and yeah, uh, I, we don't have a, a concrete plan for that. Again, it's gonna be standard to start and we'll see how it goes but we definitely want to add more, uh, yeah. Uh, we will go drill Gay Gulch, very likely, but I, I'm not gonna promise that for certain. All right, sounds good. Um, so last question here, Peter. Uh, could you just, uh, I know you did this on your last slide, but could you maybe just sum up um, the upcoming catalyst in the next uh, six to 12 months? Yeah, the, well, the, the one that sets it was the geology technical report. And so because of that, from that, it allows us to go to a mineral resource and just use that as the backbone and, and more or less bolt on the mineral resource. So that's pretty simple. That's in progress right now. Um, we'll see how long it takes, but I don't expect it to be more than two months or so uh, to complete and have it written and published. Uh, again, that's dependent on others, so I don't really know. Um, and then we start, immediately start the work on metallurgical, well, the metallurgical studies and characterization, and that will feed into the PEA. So with the drilling that we do this summer, that, that whole thing kind of ends in January, February, where we're looking again at an updated mineral resource to start, and that would probably come in, in early, mid-2023. And then the PEA would follow, and that would use the updated mineral resource. Uh, and so it'll be mid midsummer or so uh, for that. And I note, though, that the PEA itself, we're doing that because no matter how many, whatever ounces we have, if, if there are any, of course, but um, from a mineral resource perspective, because of the infrastructure, because of the gravity separation, because there's no roads or power lines required to be built, the infrastructure, the, the mining equipment for a prospective mine and the capital costs are near zero. There's just nothing really to, to do. I can go lease all the equipment I need for next to nothing. The, the capital costs are, are very going to be very, very low. And the operating costs also low. Basically, conceptually, you could go dig it up, run it across in the morning, run it across the sluice box in the afternoon, pull the mats, collect the gold, and go and sell it in the evening. Um, to, yes, I, I, I think the PEA will look remarkably marvelous uh, relative to any other metric. So that, that's why we're kind of going ahead with that as a priority. All right, well, lots to look forward to in the next uh, couple of months and out on to the next year. Um, that concludes the Q&A portion of our webinar. Uh, Peter, I just wanna thank you for taking time to host this webinar with us today. As a reminder for our audience, our next webinar will feature GCM Mining on Tuesday, May 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for tuning in with us, everyone. Have a great day.